We want to start with Constantine. And so we know from this parable right away, the premise is counterfeit faith. There's not all faith, not all professions of faith are genuine. And we might not even be able to tell. This is one of the primary ideas of the ecclesia in, in, our, in, our, in our lives, is that a profession of faith, we need to take people generally at their word, but it doesn't mean it's genuine. And that's a fact of life. It's a fact of life. And one of the hard parts of becoming a new believer is you want to believe that everyone that tells you they're a believer is genuinely a believer. You just want to believe that. You're looking for fellowship so badly. And it only takes a few years of maturity until you get burned enough times that you realize that this parable is true. What do you know about the Roman emperor known as Constantine the Great? Constantine had this experience, which we're going to talk about, at the Milvan Bridge in Rome in 312 AD, a long time ago. And so Constantine is a very, very significant person in the history of the church. The context for the arrival of this emperor named Constantine, who many believe became a Christian, there's a lot of debate as to whether he was, and we'll talk about that, is what was going on before Constantine? And so, yeah, so what, you, what we've got to understand about the, the context of the first 300 years of the life of believers was that generally the life of a believer was very not like the life of a believer today in America. I mean, massive persecution. Massive persecution. If you were identified as being a follower of Jesus, you were generally sub looked at as suspect because, first of all, it took a while for the Roman Empire to figure out who Christians were because they didn't, couldn't figure out whether they were Jews or not. Um, because there were some Jews that were part of this movement, and there were a lot of Gentiles, though, so they couldn't really figure out what was going on. But they found out a lot of Jews hated these Christians, as, lot, as well as a lot of Gentiles. So they couldn't quite figure it out, but they knew one thing. They didn't believe like we did. They didn't believe in the gods of the empire, and that made them suspect. And they didn't quite believe like the Jews did, because even though the Jews in Israel didn't believe in the gods of the empire, Israel was given a state exemption from practicing paganism because the empire realized, look, this is a separate ethnic group with a historic heritage that is exempt from our practices. Christians or believers in Messiah, Jewish or Gentile, weren't exempt like Israel was because even a large portion of Israel said, these guys are nuts. The rumors about believers this time were that not only did, did were they rebels and they were traitors to the state because they didn't believe in the gods of the state, but they also were cannibals. They ate the body of one of their guys they followed, and they were they drank the blood. And they had these communions, love feasts, love dinners. So these were rumors that developed, and so they became very much scapegoats. And in Rome, when Nero wanted to do a new building program for his palace, uh, he burnt the city down and blamed the Christians, the believers. And there was a very significant persecution of believers within the localized community of Rome in 64 AD, where Nero mounted them on stakes, large part lit up his gardens by painting them with tar and lighting them on fire. So you could walk the Roman gardens all night long while believers were burning his torches. And it was during that Neronian persecution in 64, 65, 66 AD that it is believed Paul and Peter were, were both uh, martyred at the hands of, uh, of Nero's persecution. Now, after that, it wasn't necessarily official Roman policy to kill Christians, but they weren't liked, and there was these spasmatic persecutions throughout the empire. They enjoyed some solace here and there, but they were always a suspect people group. Not an ethnic people group, but an ideological people group. It wasn't, so right before Constantine comes on the scene in 312, which we'll talk about next Monday, there's this major persecution by this Roman emperor named Diocletian. It's known as the Great Persecution, and it starts in 303 AD, and it lasts for 10 years and it's empire-wide, it really, really does major damage in terms of putting believers to death, taking their property from them. It really freaks believers out completely. They become state enemies officially of the global empire, which is a pretty big spate of territory. So we want to understand that as our context for Constantine. Even though Constantine, there's a lot of suspicion about who he was, people that had gone through a lot of hardship with the Roman Empire were glad to see him especially believers, and you can understand why. The beginning of the 4th century AD, Diocletian, who was the Roman emperor at that time, had separated the Roman Empire into basically a tetrarchy. 
four jurisdictions. It was too big to manage on his own. And so uh, he, as Augustus, had four Caesars. Basically, if you split the Roman Empire into quadrants, there was a Caesar, sub-Caesar, for his, him as Augustus, managing each quadrant. Constantine's father, Constantius, was the Caesar or the ruler over the northwest quadrant, Great Britain and northern France. Constantius was married to a woman named Helena. Helena became a believer at some point during her life. And one of the interesting aspects of the uh, spreading of the faith of Messiah Jesus among the Roman world is that, well, actually, for the first century, you know that the, the faith of uh, believers in Yeshua, Yeshua Messiah were mostly Jewish. As Gentiles started to enter the fold more and more, the slave world became particularly connected to Christianity because of all of the benefits, perceived benefits, and real benefits of being a believer if the rest of your life was cons consigned to that of being a slave in the Roman Empire. Uh, but more and more as the year 100 AD and 200 AD and went on, kind of like Jesus' ministry in, in Israel, more and more wealthy women and wealthy Gentile women became connected to becoming, became believers. Also the process started, believe it or not, of within the military, Roman soldiers and even centurions and uh, military officers in the Roman Empire becoming secret believers or connected to believing communities. Eventually, again, Constantius, the Caesar of the northwest quadrant of the Roman Empire, his wife became a believer, Helena, and their son was named Constantine. Constantius was grooming his son Constantine. So Constantine's mom was a believer, although Constantine's father was not a believer that we know of. And then Constantius, Constantine's father, was training Constantine to take over as leader of the Roman Empire, as leader of that area of the Roman Empire. As you might guess, happened with uh, a lot of the history of monarchies and, and tyrannies. Diocletian died in 311 AD. What do you think happened among the four sub-Caesars of the empire? Yeah, they, they started to say, hey, I, you know, there was a civil war, basically. It began a period of civil war. Now, right upon Diocletian's death, the person that started the great persecution, one of the sub-Caesars, a guy named Galerius, actually passed a law called the Edict, this is 311 AD, passed a law called the Edict of Toleration that ended the great persecution officially as Roman policy. That was a big deal. So this is before Constantine even really rose to significance in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, as a matter of policy, ended the Great Persecution, realizing that this was just too expensive an under undertaking. Too many people were becoming sympathizers with believers, which the Roman Empire didn't want to happen. And so they, uh, the, the Roman Empire adopted the rule of toleration, which allowed Christianity to be practiced without the office of state being used to persecute. Now, local persecution still was going on throughout the communities in the Roman Empire, but as a state policy, it came to an end. The sub-Caesar uh, that ruled the southwest quadrant of the Roman Empire, specifically Rome at that time, a guy named Maxentius, uh, was starting to make moves in terms of taking over the entire empire, and so Constantine's father, Constantius, passed away earlier, and Constantine decided, I want to run the empire. So he gathered up all his military in northern France and decided we're marching on Rome, guys. So he brought his army military south into Italy. Maxentius in Rome realized a fight's going to go on, so he moved north of Rome to confront Constantine. And so on the Tiber River, which goes through Rome, just north of Rome, these armies started to converge. North of the Tiber, Constantine, and south of the Tiber, Maxentius. The battle was going, starting to take place at this bridge that crossed the Tiber called the Milvan Bridge. This was 312 AD, and it is at this time, history records, that Constantine received a vision from heaven. Constantine experienced a dramatic event in 312 at the Milvan Bridge, According to the sources, Constantine 
looked to the sun before the battle and saw either one of two symbols, a cross or uh, a chi rho, the, the Greek symbol chi and then rho, which is a P, which is the first two letters of the Greek word Christos. When, whatever symbol he saw in the heavens, he also heard in Greek, not Latin, in, in this vision that he had, he heard the verbal statement from heaven, in this sign, conquer. In this sign, conquer. So whatever the sign he saw, either a cross or a Cairo, in this sign, conquer. And so what con- presumably what Constantine took that to mean was that the God, you know, not uh, Jupiter or, or not Saturn, but this God Jesus would actually lead him into military victory. So immediately he told all his tr- uh, troops to begin to paint their shields with this sign, either a cross or a Cairo. And the battle ensued. And Maxentius was defeated. And Maxentius was drowned in the river Tibor. So Constantine headed south and marched on Rome and assumed the role of of emperor of the Western Empire. And Constantine started to credit this victory shortly after with this experience that he had in 312 AD. Now, what was interesting, again, about his um, assumption of the Roman throne for the Western Empire when he entered Rome was that he didn't carry out all of the normal pagan rituals. He didn't assume, um, or he didn't uh, sacrifice the pagan gods. He didn't celebrate in the way that most emperors were celebrating in, in Rome at the time. Now, he did later become Pontus Maximus, which means the chief priest of Rome, which by the way the Pope has that title today, which means the chief priest of all of the pagan empire, of all of the gods of Rome. So he did assume that title later on, but he did credit this experience to this God Jesus who his mother followed. On the heels of the Edict of Toleration that had been enacted earlier, a year later in 313 AD, he enacted another famous edict in Rome called the Edict of Milan which again was an empire-wide edict, which not only made uh, Christianity a tolerated religion, so it doubled down on the edict of toleration that preceded Constantine, but it also restored property rights to Christian and confiscated property to Christians, believers. So Constantine really marks the beginning of a major change, not from uh, significant persecution by the Roman Empire, but almost a sympathy with Christianity and leaders uh, in Christian congregations. It is believed that Constantine's mom, Helena, had a lot to do with this. In fact, she spent a lot, if any of you go to Israel, you'll see that a lot of these old sites in Jerusalem and in the land of Israel, these old shrines, were built under the direction of Constantine's mom, Helena. She made a pilgrimage to the land of Israel shortly after mm. her uh, her son became emperor, and she actually started construction of what is known as the Holy Sepulchre, which is to believe the place where Jesus was crucified, which is a, a church in Jerusalem to this day. Now, <coughs> Constantine marks a major change in world history in that it's when Christianity started to become a global religion sociologically. The question still becomes for historians to this day, looking back at, and also too, one of the debates that still goes on today is this, was Constantine a believer? You know, was Constantine in our parlance saved? There's no evidence that he has been. Well, so we're going to talk about the evidence. There's pros and cons. One of the evidences was he had this vision and he started to really support Christianity and have great sympathy with believers. And he did take great measures to end persecution, which would be, seem to indicate that he may have been saved. On the other hand, um, and so this is where we talk about counterfeit faith. On the other hand, he never got baptized until the day before his, basically the weeks preceding his death. And it seems to be either that he knew that he didn't want to, if he was saved, he didn't want to become under the authority of whoever this God he thought he was serving was, or that he thought that, you know what, 
I just am going to be doing too much bad stuff, and so I want to wait till I get a pardon at the very end. As emperor of the Roman Empire, and by the way, he ultimately entered into further civil war and conquered the East and became the sole emperor. So he entered this tetrarch, he started by Diocletian, and he became the man. He lived until 337 AD, but about 15 years after this experience in Rome, where the Melvin Bridge, where he saw the sign, he decided to execute his oldest son, Crispus. And he decided to execute his wife, a woman named Fausta. He just didn't like them. Thought they were a threat to his power, so off with their heads, or you know, they were executed, wiped from the face of the planet. So that's one significant <laughs> piece of evidence that, uh, yeah, he wasn't a believer that he may have been using Christianity as a way to gain centralization of a government of a government policy. And he may have been opportunistic in seeing that this faith is spreading like wildfire and it may soon overtake Roman paganism and it may be something we deal with. This is what the skeptics would say. Now, isn't this also where Roman Catholicism started? So I won't say Roman Catholicism, I'll say the church. Okay. It's where the church started. Yeah. All, all, all experiences that you have with Christianity today are descendants of this experience. Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, and the institutional church is a product of this experience. All churches, not just Roman Catholicism. We're going to talk about the merger, after we talk about Constantine, the merger of empire and Christian church and empire in a second, which really occurs after Constantine. Constantine, at the end of his life, did get baptized before he died. He did undergo immersion. So again, this is why this debate goes on today as to whether he was a believer or not. Some apologists claim that, uh, look, you know, he, we, we can't be too hard on the guy. He was a world, he was an emperor. He changed the status of Christianity. And he was so draconian in his changes that he couldn't do too much too fast. And he knew that he was, so this is what the apologist would say, he knew he'd have to do a lot of evil things as a ruler. So he waited until the last minute to get baptized. For folks that are a little bit harder on Constantine, uh, here's a good quote from a, a scholar named Robin Pfeiffer, would basically characterize his a- actions this way. Uh, if I believe in the Christian God, but know that I will have to do things which are against the teachings of that faith, I can be excused for doing so by postponing baptism? Yeah, I'll join a, a Alcoholics Anonymous after this crate of beer. If that isn't duplicity and subscription to a double standard, then nothing is. So, um, do we know whether Constantine was a believer or not? We're going to find out <laughs> at some point in time. <laughs> but, uh, the historians aren't sure. 